My name is Ramon Brown. I'm a research associate with the Fish Nutrition uh, Lab at uh, Aquaculture Fishery Center. Today we have uh, two of our distinguished uh, presenters. We have Dr. Madan Day, and we also have Dr. Rebecca Lockman. Um, they're going to give you their uh, their talks, and after which, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Madan Day. Um, by training, I'm an agricultural and resource economist here at UAPB Aquaculture Fisheries Center. Um, my team and I focus uh, more on fish and seafood marketing. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, uh, today is to um, talk about um, seafood and seafood affordability. So uh, welcome to our uh, workshop eight. Uh, we will have two parts of the uh, presentation. Um, first, I will be talking about uh, fish and seafood and 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 the affordability of that um, uh, these commodities. And later, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Lockman would be talking uh, more about how we could use uh, aquaculture uh, uh, and 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 fish feed to improve uh, the. Uh, omega-3 intake here in this country. Sure. Um, so uh, for my part of presentation, uh, we will be uh, focusing on these five things. First, we'll talk about uh, the importance of seafood and omega-3. Uh, Dr. Lockman again would be uh, re-emphasizing some of this point. Uh, we will be talking about the global trend in terms of public interest in omega-3 and in, in seafood, whether people are thinking about it or not. Right. We will be then talking about uh, prices of uh, seafood based on scanner data which we have in our center. And then we'll say, okay, uh, how can, what would be the cost of this uh, seafood if we like to really get an adequate amount of uh, omega-3? Uh, through our uh, uh, seafood consumption. And then I will end up with uh, some of the take-home messages and then Dr. Rebecca Lockman will, will follow it up. Um, so if you look at uh, two countries, I here I, 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 I am comparing two countries. One is uh, our uh, USA and then uh, Japan. These two countries um, have, um, both, both are member of uh, OECD, so we are, uh, these two are, uh, to rich countries in the world, but if you think of uh, their consumption habit is very, very different. That's why I'm choosing these two countries because in many cases, uh, consumption depends on affordability because it depends on the uh, amount of money you have, disposable income you have to um, uh, buy your food. Now, we are considering two countries, both are, are rich, and then see uh, how their consumption pattern uh, uh, differs. So if you look at um, Japan, you will see uh, here uh, the, their terrestrial meat consumption is not that much, uh, but if you look at the USA, we consume uh, almost three times of what uh, Japanese consume as far as uh, terrestrial meat consumption is concerned. But if you look at then um, aquatic uh, uh, protein, look at here, uh, we consume only a tiny part and they consume a big amount. Okay. If you look at the aquatic animal fat, that's what uh, I'll be mentioning uh, later in terms of this omega-3, and Dr. Uh, Lockman would be talking about also that issue. Look at here, uh, they consume uh, more than three times than what we eat here. Uh, so here, uh, uh, it's an important uh, lesson to learn. And then if we look at these two countries, we also see different life expectancy, uh, different uh, rate of uh, obesity, different incidence of heart-related illnesses. So uh, if we like to simplify, there are many other factors I'm not saying, but if, if I um, just use the simple uh, analysis, we could find that uh, seafood consumption is, in many cases, related to a better health. And again, um, uh, Dr. Lockman would be uh, mentioning this. I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a uh, um, biologist, but if you see uh, this um, long chain uh, 
fatty acid and in literature says it has a lot of positive uh, impact uh, and it, re it can it may reduce brain disorder, it can improve immune system, cardiovascular uh, disease incident can decrease, uh, mental uh, illness and, 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 and uh, cancer uh, might be also prevented to, to a certain extent. And, and, and this issue uh, is not only an US issue, it's a global issue. And, and there are so many conferences, so many um, uh, workshops going on. Uh, so it's, it's a global issue. So what, how do we uh, analyze this global uh, issue? One thing is to use Google Trend. Uh, many of us, we use Google to search. Whenever we are buying a car, whenever we are buying a refrigerator, we Google and find it out uh, what is going on. Now, this uh, kind of analysis simply show how relative to the general trend of Googling. So this is basically the way we constructed it. It's, it's, it's people uh, do the Googling for so many things. So if we consider the overall trend of Googling and then compare with the Googling on omega-3 related issues, so it's the relative importance. And we see compared to the baseline situation of overall Googling, we find that people are now uh, getting more and more interested in terms of um, uh, their, uh, uh, in terms of this omega-3 as a source of, 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 of nutrient. Um, if we look at um, the topic they are looking for, this is so the earlier slide shows the more general one. This one is more specific one. If you see, uh, what are the items people are searching through Google? Uh, compared to overall trend, we see uh, people are looking for topic like omega-3 fish, uh, omega salmon omega-3, tuna omega-3. These are the top three, uh, you know, uh, seafood and omega-3 uh, related search. So it's simply, and this is, is interesting. This is what is happening because we could analyze this for different uh, uh, region, for different country. This is for the United States. So here we see in the United States, if we compare 2005 to 2013, these data are available uh, um, uh, through Google uh, search. And, and, and in fact, we, we are now writing a paper. Uh, you might say that, okay, this Googling, uh, this is what people are simply looking at it. Are they going to buy? One of my PhD students and I are now writing a paper where we analyze this Googling trend of seafood and actual seafood consumption. And we find that a very high correlation between what people look for in a Googling search and the subsequent weekly uh, seafood consumption. So the point here is that we see more and more people are focusing on uh, fish, and omega-3 as an animal, uh, uh, as, as a, as a uh, food. Um, now, the next two slides, I will be talking about uh, the contribution of different kind of fish and seafood uh, for these three types of uh, omega-3. Uh, now, Dr. Lockman will be mentioning some of those things later again. Uh, DPA, EPA, DHA, uh, these are the, um, you know, uh, long-chain fatty acid. And if you look at the contribution of different uh, animal uh, protein, and you will find protein source, you will find a huge difference. And now, um, we often, whenever we talk about um, omega-3, we often think of salmon, we often think of uh, tuna, but think about even fish species which are not really good source of omega-3. But if we compare that with other, think about tilapia, think about channel catfish, uh, you will see that even these poorer sources of omega-3 provides more omega-3 compared to other terrestrial source of animal protein, like chicken, beef, pork, and lamb. So what I'm saying is that even, forget about uh, Atlantic salmon, forget about all uh, uh, tuna and others, even tilapia and catfish, which are poor sources of uh, 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 omega-3, still are better than many of the terrestrial uh, source of meat. Again, we need to emphasize here, whenever we are talking about tilapia and, and, and channel catfish, you know, 
they are not only providing omega-3, but they are also providing other micronutrients, they are also providing uh, protein. Protein is the main source for which we normally eat um, fish, right? Uh, we eat uh, protein, uh, eat pro fish for protein, we eat potatoes or rice uh, or pasta for carbohydrate, but even when we uh, consider uh, omega-3 for uh, tilapia and catfish, we find that they are better source than uh, beef, pork, and lamb. So here, some of the earlier I was mentioning um, fin fish, which are fish with fin. Here I'm talking about uh, crustaceans. Uh, we are talking about mollusks. We are talking about other uh, uh, seafood. And we see that they are good source of um, omega-3 compared to terrestrial uh, animal protein source. Now, if we consider protein vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fat and carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrate, if look at here, uh, this aquatic thing, including aquatic plants, is a high source of animal protein, but they are also leaner. Uh, and they are also uh, providing lower uh, calorie, so it's it's really a good uh, um, uh, product, and this is this is a, a public from a published literature. Um, so if you if you look at other source of uh, micronutrient, uh, it's a similar uh, story. We see catfish, uh, we see uh, fin fish, we see mollusks, we see crustaceans are good source of. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, micronutrient. Uh, same principle goes with vitamins uh, 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 and folic acid. So, fin fish, crustaceans, and mollusks, as we see, are good source of uh, protein uh, and good, good fat and other micronutrients and, and vitamins. Now, how, how about our consumption? Again, as I said, I, I, we are doing some sort of a global analysis. Look at here, uh, we see. Um, mm. This is 2012 uh, uh, number. Um, so there are two, two, two issues here. One is our per capita supply of fish, kilograms of fish uh, we eat per year, uh, and uh, fish as a part of total animal protein. Now think about um, China. Uh, uh, from the economic point of view, is much, much uh, poorer than us. Uh, you look at their per capita uh, consumption is about 31. And in, in many, many of the Asian, and how much we do, uh, it's about 15, right? Um, and if you look at uh, what, is country, what proportion of these animal proteins comes from fish, it's very low. And you know, in many of these countries, like Japan, uh, they are a huge consumer of uh, seafood, and seafood really constitute a very high proportion of their overall animal protein intake. But we, 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 we here are far, far away from uh, even the global, global average. In many cases, we consume much less animal protein, much less, I'm sorry, much less uh, uh, seafood protein uh, compared to some of the poorest country, including, for example, Cambodia. Uh, I, I, and uh, Cambodia, uh, seafood consumption is much, much, much higher. Uh, compared to us. And if you look their per capita income and our per capita in income, you cannot even graph it. So, 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 so that's an important issue. Uh, so it is an important issue. If you look uh, into the literature, into the, uh, our uh, American Heart Association, they are talking about asking at least to eat two. Yeah. Now, if you look at this uh, farm bill, 2008 farm bill, even this, this most recent farm bill, you see uh, 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 this is highly, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> flagship item, uh, even for White House. Um, uh, so, um, so we see even for USDA dietary guidelines, they're saying that we should have at least uh, 250 to 500 milligrams of uh, EPA DHA. Uh, so 500 milligram is recommended, or at least half of it is 250. So you might say, oh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, it is good to eat, but do I have money to buy it? Can we afford it? Because that's the bottom line. You know, If we cannot really afford it we, for many of the vulnerable communities, we would not be able to provide uh, uh, 
fish as a source of um, omega-3. So what I would be doing here for the next um, 15 minutes or so, right? Uh, right about six. Six, okay, okay. We started a little late. Okay, we started a little late, okay. So, so, so what we'll do, I'll quickly go through some of the um, price-related issues, affordability-related issues, see whether we could really uh, uh, afford this fish. What we did, we in our center got this uh, scanner data. Think about it, if we go to a supermarket like uh, Walmart, we go to a counter and then somebody uh, um, scan that item and they click, click. So we see that item, that maybe bottle of water, um, we purchase at the rate of $2 per bottle, and it is getting re recorded. What happened is that some companies then buy this data, uh, data set, and we, marketing researchers, again, buy it from them. And we analyze how prices, how much quantity are being sold in different weeks, uh, how it is changing over the time, how prices are changing. And we have in Aquaculture Fishery Center at UAPB this database from 2009 to 2013 for uh, 52 markets uh, on a weekly basis for so many commodities, including now we just got a data set which even uh, includes mutton, beef, and chicken. Earlier, our emphasis used to be seafood. We are now even checking um, the substitutability. I have a PhD student who will be looking into not only the seafood, but also uh, the chicken and, 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 and uh, beef and, and pork. So uh, based on this data, and this data includes not only uh, the supermarket, it includes gas station, it includes mama papa store, it includes uh, um, drug stores, and, 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 and we are trying to get uh, this data to see uh, the price of this uh, fish. Now, what I will be showing here is that, okay, if we like to uh, follow uh, USDA or White House recommendation, how much uh, we need to pay per week and how many servings of fish we need to have per week. So this is, remember, we said 500 milligrams per week or half of it. So we have two. One is uh, 3,500, 3, uh, which is 500 times seven and this is the half of it. And we'll see here, if we like to get it through salmon, uh, we need to have less than two serving a week. Uh, that will cost us about uh, two and a half uh, dollar. Uh, same story we find for trout, again, uh, about uh, slightly over two and a half uh, dollar, uh, two dollars, 60, 70 cents, and we need to have only uh, two serving per, per week. This is another one, this is through trout. And then if we look into uh, several fish and cod, um, this is the number. Again, within the range of $2.50 uh, through uh, $2.70, and then about uh, two servings a, a week. If we talk about uh, mackerel, uh, again, we have to see that many of these things are um, processed product, and we have, um, you know, uh, sometime oil, sometime um, salt, water. We have to also consider those, but if we eat all the things uh, there, we, we, if we're not losing some of this fat, oh, sorry. So we see here, um, again, uh, we need to have slightly uh, more than $2.50, and we can get uh, our adequate uh, or recommended level of uh, animal uh, omega-3. Um, if we look at uh, sardine, again, uh, it's just really uh, not an expensive product. Uh, we could get uh, with uh, slightly over $2.50 the required amount of omega-3 we are supposed to uh, uh, eat. Uh, again, mollusk, uh, if we do that, um, more or less similar story. Um, if we took uh, here, we see uh, you know, this is earlier we, we, we talked about oyster, uh, here we talked about mussels, um, similar, uh, similar figure. Um, now, uh, if we consider others, which are slightly more expensive source of omega-3 compared to what I just showed you, uh, we find that, you know, uh, within $4, we can get a variety of um, animal uh, um, seafood which would provide the uh, right amount of omega-3. Uh, so you could have even for more expensive like, uh, um, you know, source would be, for example, trout. Uh, we could still have uh, within 
$5 per week limit. So what I'm saying is that we have a lot of choices available which are uh, within the affordability uh, limit of many uh, American. If we to, uh, to grow to other uh, commodities like, uh, for example, uh, grouper, well, it's not a main source of, of uh, omega-3, but still, uh, uh, you know, this is about uh, $30 uh, a, a, a week. Uh, Mollusk and crustaceans, we could, again, um, uh, from Louisiana, if we have this uh, crawfish, that's not really a fatty kind of thing, but still, it's, it's not, you know, if you think about it, it's about 30, 34, 30, 50, 40 dollars per week. That's, but remember, this is not the main source of uh, omega-3. They have other purpose. They produce, uh, they supply protein, they supply other micronutrients. What I'm saying is that uh, we have variety of choice, it depends. Uh, but don't uh, uh, think that, okay, this uh, high price means that they are not good item because they are a provider of other important nutrients. Uh, here we are just focusing on um, uh, omega-3. So uh, what we have here is that um, we can get omega-3 from a variety of uh, sources. Um, and it is uh, affordable to have um, recommended uh, 500 milligram per, uh, per day or even uh, 250 milligram uh, per day, or, uh, which would be basically two times a week or one time a week, broad figure. And we could do meat mats because depending on our preference, different people uh, we are saying, because we are not prescribing that you have to eat that particular fish because you could have uh, your fish coming from a different sources, still uh, you could uh, uh, have a affordable combination. So here is some sort of a summary. If you look at here, what you see, uh, you see a lot of fish uh, where you are, think about it, paying less than four or five dollar per week to have full doses of uh, required uh, omega-3. Uh, many fish we, we, we analyze. So you see within four or five you can get many. Uh, and if we are talking about half of it, uh, you have so many uh, sources. So it is possible. Um, so uh, what we are saying is that seafood has uh, more to offer and uh, many of the fish I discussed are coming from capture fisheries but uh, in our aquaculture fisheries center uh, Dr. Lockman and, and his her team are also working as to how we could improve some of this omega-3 uh, level even in, in, in fish like um, um, catfish, which is not a really prime source of omega-3, but we, it is possible to improve the omega-3 for um, uh, those, those species. So um, hopefully you will have some uh, seafood in the future uh, to have uh, uh, better uh, intake of omega-3. Uh, thank you for listening to me and, and please do listen to Dr. Lockman for more information. And at this stage, if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. I just wanted to make mention that uh, Brookshire's store has an interesting article in their publication this, this, this week about fish, the type of fish. I don't know if you've seen that article yet. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to make mention that. Yeah. And also, <clears throat> I'm really concerned about, uh, uh, of course, there's the movement now for more fish oils, you know, that will, uh, uh, which contains omega-3. Oh, uh, 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 the medicine as a, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that, that yeah. truly helps the, the body. That's yeah. a big push in our medical world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not against that appeal as, as a uh, uh, omega-3, but remember what we need to be uh, thinking is that can we get a balanced diet, what we, you know, what we like to consume, and at the same time, can we get this as a byproduct? Because remember, most of the time we eat fish for what? We eat fish as a source of protein. We do not eat fish for uh, carbohydrate. We do not eat because if we like to have a carbohydrate, we'll go for potatoes or we'll go for pasta or 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 or, or rice. But we eat fish for uh, protein. Now, what I'm saying is that whenever whenever we are just having fish as a source of protein, for many many cases, we simply get that additional uh, nutrient, which is omega three, which are really required. Uh, based on the, our seafood consumption, so 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 th that's that's the point. Well, thank you very much.
very much, yeah. Dr. Day. Right. Well, thank you very much for uh, staying for the second part. Um, Dr. Day did uh, provided excellent coverage of the nutrient properties of fish. Um, I'm going to cover the research aspects of how we try to manipulate the lipid content of farmed fish to make them healthier for people. Uh, this uh, official announcement came out in 2011 and there have been many other similar announcements since then uh, talking about the fact that most Americans do not consume as much seafood as they should to be getting the healthful properties. And um, there are a variety of nutrients you can get from fish and it's all good. But one of the more unique nutrients that fish tend to have in higher supply are the omega-3 fatty acids. And these are the long chain omega-3 fatty acids as opposed to the kind you can get from plants. For uh, our research, because this is catfish eating country, we do focus mostly on the channel catfish. And also because the catfish has been criticized for being one of the fish on the markets that's a little bit lower in the omega-3 fatty acids. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with catfish as a very healthy fish to consume. It just happens to be lower in omega-3s like than compared to salmon. It is naturally low in omega-3s. We don't make it that way. Um, some fish just are, but there are ways that we can enhance them in a farming environment because we have control over what they eat. So uh, as Dr. Day was saying, there is increasing awareness of the health benefits of omega-3 fatty acids, and it's a big concern because in this country in particular, we really don't get nearly enough. Um, originally, back in the olden days before we had you know, ready access to food at the grocery store and food was much less processed and less industrialized, there was closer to a one-to-one -one intake of the different types of fatty acids, omega-3s and omega-6s. We need both types, but we need them in the correct balance. So um, one of the ways traditionally in aquaculture diets that we add some omega-3s is to use marine fish meal and marine fish oil. The problem is that the stocks of wild fish that these products are taken from are dwindling. And they're also considered sort of environmentally unsustainable to use. The catfish people kind of took them out of the diets a long time ago because they're also expensive and they tend to reduce the shelf life of the product. They're very prone to oxidation. So are there other ways that we can improve the diets and therefore the health properties of catfish without using marine fish meal and oil? So as I just said, we do actually need both types, omega-3 and omega-6 are both essential fatty acids for people. We just get many, many more of the omega-6 type in our typical American diets. Most people are aware that uh, fish, fatty fish like salmon and trout are very high in omega-3s, and they are. But uh, like I said, with the farmed fish, since we control what they eat, we can also affect their lipid content by the lipid that we put and the fat that we put in the diet. And they've already seen a list of uh, properties affected by these long chain omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, what's the underlying mechanism for all of these health benefits is that the uh, omega-3 long chain polyunsaturates are uh, anti-inflammatory. So that's a big reason why they have such a big effect on so many processes in the cardiovascular system. Uh, they also affect cholesterol. They increase the good kind of cholesterol, the high density lipoprotein, HDL reduce triglycerides and also reduce LDL. So the result is fewer uh, heart attacks and fewer strokes. This is a comparison of some of the most popularly consumed fish in this country. Uh, the two salmonids, trout and salmon, and then catfish and tilapia are also very widely consumed. And you can see there's a stark contrast between the amount of these longer chain omega-3 fatty acids, much higher in trout than salmon, and that's true for naturally uh, caught fish or farm-raised fish, but it's because of what they put in the diet. Uh, and the catfish and tilapia traditionally have been fed diets with much less omega-3s in the diet, and so the fish themselves also are lower in those omega-3s. There, uh, there are a number of different uh, alternative fats out there that we could put in a fish diet to try to improve the health value of catfish and tilapia. Uh, but we want to be sure that we stay away from those marine products for the reasons I mentioned. They're expensive, environmentally unfriendly, and they re can reduce the shelf life of the fish. This shows you another comparison of different types of creatures. Some of these are not as commonly consumed as others, but you see there are others even higher than salmon in these omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturates, uh, tuna, squill, uh, squid, krill, uh, krill is like a small crustacean, which people wouldn't typically eat, but 
that can be eaten by something else that you're more likely to eat. Uh, and then you have decreasing amounts of these total omega-3 long-chain fatty acids as you go through these, these different classes of fish. Uh, and we have catfish at the bottom there, um, although like I said, there's potential to increase that based on what we feed them in a farming environment. And then I, I have a little note here too that wild catfish do actually have more of these fatty acids than farmed fish, but wild catfish also only have half the total fat. So you'd have to eat a whole lot more of the wild still to get a lot of omega-3s. What uh, we have to consider when we're looking at different types of fats to put in the fish diet is not just the effect on the final product, but first of all, we have to get that fish through the production cycle. We have to make sure it grows, it survives, it's healthy, uh, and that it will actually get to the point where we can market it. So that's our, our first concern. And then, um, once we do get through the production cycle, assuming the lipid equally supports you know, growth and survival and health, um, then it has the healthy fatty acids that we want in there, but what about product quality? How well is it going to keep? And what about the taste? What about the texture and those properties that people look for? Especially if you're used to eating catfish on a regular basis, you want it to taste a certain way. This is a, a comparison including fish along with uh, the most commonly consumed land sources of meat. And you can see that, sure, catfish is lower compared to salmon, but then look at all of these, these land sources of meat are lower than catfish in those specific, uh, this, this shows the balance between omega-3 and omega-6. So the higher the number there means the more omega-3s you have. So, uh, you know, poultry actually in this case is the lowest. Although these animals also, you know, you can vary their fatty acid composition depending on what you put in their diet. Less control over a cow because it's a ruminant, but uh, you can enhance any of these products with omega-3s. We work with fish, so we want people to eat fish. The uh, vegetable or plant lipids are um, interesting from the standpoint that they're, they're very large quantities of some of these produced globally, so it's considered more environmentally sustainable to include some of these kinds of lipids, plant lipids in fish diets. Um, we do have to remember though that the plants, even the ones that have omega-3s, do not have the particular kind. They don't have the long chain polyunsaturates, uh, like Madame kept showing, the EPA and the DHA. Those are two of the key long chain polyunsaturates that are more typical of fish. Okay, so plants have a shorter kind that can be converted to the longer kind by people but the conversion rate is very low. It's like less than 2% in adults. So, you know, these are, these are healthy products, but they're not gonna give you those long chain polyunsaturates that you can get from fish. So, like I said, when we replace the uh, fish oil, we have to consider what's gonna happen, first of all, to the fish. When we use rendered animal fats, like uh, we can use poultry fat, or we can use uh, tallow, lard, things like that, uh, we find that if you, replace more than half of the fish oil with those animal fats, it will reduce the growth of, especially the carnivorous fish species. And of course you will, any, anytime you replace the fish oil, you're gonna have a decrease in the long chain polyunsaturates in the fish itself. When we uh, replace the fish oil with plant oils, we can do that up to a higher degree. Up to 60 to 70% of the fish oil can be taken out without reducing the fish growth. So the main problem there is that once again, you will have a decrease in those healthy omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturates. So uh, we've done a series of research studies trying to look at the use of different kinds of oils in catfish diets to improve their health value for humans. In this first study, we, uh, we included a diet with soybean oil, um, and that's just because that's sort of like using a blank. It doesn't really change the fatty acid profile of the diet when we add it because there's so much soybean meal in the diet already. Uh, then we use Menhaden fish oil, that's traditionally what we put in a fish diet. And then uh, flaxseed oil is a plant source that's very high in the shorter chain omega-3s. And we uh, fed these fish uh, until they reached food size, um, probably took about 14 weeks to do this. And at the end of this trial, we measured the fatty acid composition of the filet, and also we did sensory analysis of the fish. So from left to right, these fish were fed the soybean oil diet, these got the fish oil, this is the flax oil treatment. You'll notice that the fish that received either omega-3 source, fish oil or flax oil, ended up with significantly higher 
long chain omega-3 fatty acids in the filet than fish that were fed the soybean oil. Uh, and that's because the fish can convert the shorter chain omega-3 fatty acids to the longer chain ones. So in this case, we actually got about equal levels of the longer chain fatty acids even when we fed the plant source of omega-3, which is good. We'd like to see that. Uh, but the news was not all good. Uh, once we uh, subjected the fillets to a sensory evaluation, we did this at Mississippi State, which is right in the heart of catfish production country, and we, we knew that they would do a good job. They, they know what they're doing. Um, again, from left to right, we have that's the soy diet, fish diet, and the flax diet. The blue bar is overall acceptability of the fillet. So this is just, just like everything combined, the, the smell, the taste, the appearance, uh, the texture, uh, one overall score. And you'll notice that uh, the fish that received the soy diet had the highest overall acceptability. Uh, either of these fillets that had more omega-3s had lower acceptability. And then the trend with off flavor was similar. The uh, off flavor, which is generally considered not desirable, it comes from a, a lot of different sources. Uh, in this case, it came from their diet. Uh, the off flavor was lowest in fish fed the soy oil and it was better in fish fed, I'm sorry, it was higher in fish fed the, the fish oil diet or the flax oil diet. And so that's not a good result. Not what we wanted to see. So we found that, yes, indeed, we could substitute fish oil or flax oil and get more omega-3 long chain fats in the catfish fillet, but that, that then reduced the sensory properties of the fish. So we still have more work to do. In our second study, we tested a bigger variety of different oils. Um, algae is actually the natural source of omega-3 long chain fatty acids. No animals can make that. So fish like salmon that have it, they've accumulated it through the food chain from algae. So why not just cut out the middleman and just start with the algae, put that in the fish diet, see what happens. Um, there are also, omega-3s are not the only healthy fatty acids. They've gotten a lot of press and, and you know, with good reason, but there's another class called conjugated linoleic acids that also has some very similar health properties to the omega-3s. And there was um, a colleague at Fayetteville developed a soybean oil that was particularly high in conjugated linoleic acids. So we tested regular soybean oil against soy with the CLAs uh, and included the algae oil and also fish oil, again, as kind of a control across the studies. And just to uh, compare side by side, DHA is one of the primary omega-3 long chain fatty acids that has the health benefits uh, described previously. Um, in addition to the things having to do with the heart, you know, it can reduce anything that is caused by inflammation, arthritis, asthma, those kinds of things. Um, there's a very strong association too between how much DHA is in the brain and overall brain function, cognitive ability. So you want those in your diet, especially early. When you're a baby, when you don't have control over what you eat, that's when you, you need those fatty acids. Um, the conjugated linoleic acids in humans primarily have been marketed for weight loss. In fish, that's not our concern. We just, uh, we, if it has health benefits for the fish, that's great. But we want to try to get them into the diet of the fish and then into the fish itself so we can eat it. We uh, used commercial floating feeds and just added 2% of each of these different kinds of oil to the diet. Uh, so we just put uh, the diet in this concrete mixer and just uh, top dressed these oils onto floating feeds so we could still feed the fish and observe their behavior normally. In this case, we had to run the study for 22 weeks. We started with smaller fish uh, and we wanted to grow them to food size. Three quarters pounds, probably the low end of food size. And at harvest, we again analyzed the fatty acid composition of the filet. We did consumer preference testing, this time at the food science lab in Fayetteville. Uh, and we also wanted to look at how well the filets held up during refrigeration and freezing. So this shows the content of DHA, one of those key long chain polyunsaturates uh, in fish fed, the, fish fed the different diets. The fish that got the diets higher in that fatty acid, fish oil and algae oil, had significantly higher levels of that fatty acid in their filet. And then fish that were fed either of the soy oils, this is uh, just soy with added CLA, uh, had lower DHA, which we expected. You know, fish are what they eat. With uh, CLAs, the trend was much more stark. I mean, if there's no CLA in the diet, there's no CLA in the fish. 
So only the fish that were fed the CLA diet had measurable levels of that fatty acid. But it was good to see it would accumulate in the fish fillet. During the uh, refrigerated storage test, uh, this shows the trend over time was the same for all the diets. Uh, from the initial values, it increased uh, over time, whether they were chilled or frozen. Uh, not much difference between chilled and frozen, but the important thing to note is that it didn't matter which diet the fish were fed, that had no effect on their keeping quality. They all performed about the same. Then this shows uh, catfish aromatics. You think of you know, the way they smell, but of course smell is closely related to taste. So um, this uh, shows different components that the, uh, the taste panel is trained to check for. Um, musty, dusty, old books, sulfury, some things like this. This is why they have to be trained. I don't think most of us would be able to pick that out. But the only uh, significant effect we saw here was that the fish that were fed the fish oil had a green, grassy, off flavor which we're not sure why, but um, that's probably not considered desirable uh, in a fish that you eat. So uh, that was one, of one more negative associated with the fish oil diet. <coughs> then uh, consumer preference overall, uh, from the top dark blue and light blue areas there, those get the highest rating, favorable ratings. Uh, at the bottom with the orange yellow zones, that's, those are more unfavorable in terms of overall impression of the fish. And you'll notice uh, with the fish that were fed the fish oil diet or the algae oil diet, high in omega-3s, uh, you had more uh, consumers who rated them lower, you know, more dislike moderately to dislike very much. So, and this is just another uh, maybe easier way to look at it, consumer preference overall, flavor, just plain flavor. Uh, fish that were fed either one of the soy diets uh, were preferred by consumers. So. This healthy CLA added to the soy, they apparently couldn't taste that, couldn't tell the difference. Whereas fish that had either of the omega-3 enhanced diets and higher omega-3s in the filet, they didn't like the taste as much. And the trend was basically the same for firmness. Somehow the fish higher um, in omega-3s didn't uh, have the firm properties that consumers wanted. All right, so from that trial, we got that yes, we can change the oil in the diet and we can modify the fatty acid composition of the fish. We can make them healthier for people, but then they don't like the taste as much. Um, it didn't affect the shelf life, no matter what kind of fat that fish had in them, they all did about the same during cold storage. So we still have more work to do. Um, because this CLA soy diet supported fish growth and health and survival, and also because it passed the taste test, we did a finishing trial with this particular uh, oil. In this case, we tried higher levels. We used 2% previously, and here we had a 4% 4 and a 6% treatment. Uh, and the idea here is that you know these diets with specialty oils are gonna be more expensive. So we're trying to introduce them just right at the end of the production cycle so that right at the end, the fish will take up those healthy fatty acids and then they'll be in the fish when you market it. So this, uh, we ran this over a four month period and we tested fish periodically uh, and analyzed them. And in particular, of course, we're interested in how much of the healthy fatty acids, the CLAs in this case, they accumulated. Um, this is different types of CLAs. The total of CLA is this uh, like chartreuse line there. And these were fish fed zero, fish fed 4%, fish fed 6%. So you can see that over time, uh, there was kind of pretty much a dose response effect. The more CLAs that were in the diet, the more ended up in the fish. Okay, so we know that we can, we can enhance uh, the catfish with these soy CLA uh, oils, and we know that it won't affect the taste, and the fish continues to perform well with those alternative oils. So then, like with anything else, what's the bottom line? Can the farmers still make a profit if they use this more expensive oil? Well, right now, uh, we know that the, the algae oil is actually even more expensive than fish oil. So <coughs> that probably won't be used um, in a fish diet for a while unless they can use a lower grade of it or something. The CLA soy oil, because it is especially oil, it's going to be more expensive than regular soy, but less expensive than fish oil. So we're, we're thinking that's maybe a good prospect. So with all of these, uh, these studies designed to improve the uh, health value of catfish, uh, we have to be mindful of a number of different factors. It's never just one thing. 
Of course, oil has to be safe. We don't want to use anything that's going to be a consequence <coughs> of mercury or PCBs or anything like that. Uh, it has to support just regular production performance of the fish. Um, it has to be, we have to use oils that are not going to be seen uh, by the environmental groups as, you know, something to stay away from. Um, and they do have to cost into the diet. They have to result in a profit for the farmer. <coughs> Specialty oils are more expensive, but we might be able to uh, sell the product for a higher price to health conscious consumers. And then, of course, above all, you know, whatever you eat, you want it to taste good. So there are uh, a number of different candidates we can continue to work with and experiment with. Uh, you can do pretty much <coughs> anything with a plant oil, either with genetic modification or just chemically modifying it in the lab. There are some other wild sources of omega-3s like krill oil. I don't know if you've seen these omega red capsules like they have in Walmart. That's krill oil, a uh, much more concentrated source of omega-3s, also like four times more expensive. Uh, supposedly they don't have the fishy taste. Um, I don't really see how that can be environmentally sustainable either in the long run. It's just a good supply of it now, but that's the base of the marine food chain. Um, and then there's some new plant products that can be modified with microorganisms. Remember, the omega-3s come from algae to begin with. Uh, there are all kinds of algae and fungi that can be added to distillers' grains or other plant products to enhance the omega-3 fatty acids in products that wouldn't normally have them. These are the long chain omega-3s that we would get from fish. Um, and then there's another ways to genetically modify either the fish directly or something that we feed the fish. But right now there's a lot of resistance to the use of genetically modified organisms, especially people are afraid to eat um, animal products that were genetically modified. So, you know, the technology is there, but uh, I don't know how acceptable it will be in the near term. Okay, so. With that, I will take any questions. Now, all this research is with the catfish. What about tilapia? Uh, we haven't focused as much on tilapia because, you know, we don't grow as much tilapia in this country. Catfish is the number one fin fish grown in this country. Uh, but the tilapia, I think, is the most consumed yeah, that's what fish. So, um, yeah, we've, uh, I've mostly done tilapia work with my students from Africa. and. They're not looking at fatty acid composition. It's different concerns over there, but uh, we do. I do have some plans to work with Tom in the future. Okay. Everybody's ready for lunch. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much.